know if people just suck more than me, or if I'm actually halfway decent. I don't think history repeats itself. History rhymes. I think that's Mark Twain. And if we don't know where that rhyme is going to go, we're left out in the dust. All right, uh, we're going to try something new today. Um, I'm going to play a game that I'm really new at playing and answer some history questions uh, while we're doing it. So it'll be interesting. I've only played this game a few times. Um, Never really, never really was into Halo growing up. So, uh, yeah. So I just want to reiterate, I am new to this. I've played this game a small handful of times. I did not grow up playing Halo. I've played Halo, like, a teeny tiny bit. What I am good at is history. <laughs> so I'm going to try and do one thing I'm not good at combined with one thing I am good at and see how that goes. So the first question, uh, it's one that I've been waiting to answer for a while, and that is basically, what is the Apocrypha? And what does it do? Hey. So, um, the Apocrypha is basically a set of books of the Bible, which were deemed not good enough to be in the Bible in some translations whether it's because the reliability of the sources is questionable or not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and I know that if I'm not 100% sure, it sounds bad considering that I'm mentioning it in a video that is all about history. What the heck? Is that like a freaking Velosa chicken? Um, whoa, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming these guys are really bad because I am not good. So the Apocrypha is just a, a set of books of the Bible that were removed for whatever reason. Um, but the thing is, there's some versions of it that haven't been removed. So for example, uh, in several translations of the Catholic Bible, they are still included, uh, but in several translations of the Catholic Bible, they're not. So I know like the Thousand Years translation um, does include the, Ma uh, the, the Maccabees and other books of the Apocrypha, but I also know that like well, obviously the, the oh, I, I can't remember the name in English, but the, the Gdańska or the Warszawska translations uh, in the Polish Catholic Bibles do not have them. And so, uh, and so for some reason they were removed. Some people, I think, just didn't like them or didn't trust the validity of all of them, or they also just didn't, like, think they should be included. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, scriptures that were talked about and kind of removed during several meetings where they decided what would and would not be in the Bible. And there are several accounts of people who basically um, said that, you know, they removed my favorite scriptures and whatnot, so how dare they do that. Um, and I don't actually know what all is in it because I haven't had the opportunity to read it. Uh, well, I guess I've had the opportunity. They've been around for a long time. But what I do know is in it is one of the most famous stories uh, of the Apocrypha, which is the Maccabees. Um, Maccabees story is where we get the story behind Hanukkah, which is going on right now as I'm recording this video, or will be going on soon after. Pretty sure it's going. Ah. So, the story of the Maccabees has to do with some sort of invasion or siege. Uh, I know that much, and they had only enough oil to get through um, one night, but for some reason the candles, the oil was able to last them eight nights, and that's why you have the menorah, which is uh, eight candles, which represent all the different nights that the oil was able to burn, despite them not having enough. Um, and then the apocrypha is also where the word apocryphal comes from, or well, maybe it's the other way around. Uh, I'm not an etymologist, but... Basically, the, the two words are related. Um, apocryphal meaning it might be true, might not be true. Uh, and so it wasn't like included mainly um, as a good source of a reliable source. Dang it. So that's, that's the Apocrypha in a very distracted, rambling nutshell. 
I'm gonna go to the next one that I know the least about, which is a breakdown of the electors in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, you know, that's a great one. I don't really know a whole lot about the Holy Roman Empire. How did I get that? Anyway, so um, I know the general ideas about the Holy Roman Empire as it pertains to my area of expertise. Um, as far as the politics and the political workings of it though, my understanding is that the electors were people who had gathered together what the heck, to choose the next king of, or rather emperor, of the Holy Roman Empire. And so these German electors were people who would Uh, decide who would be in the position of power next. You know, they were the ones who decided, oh, we're gonna have this person, oh, dang it, we're gonna have this person be in charge of the empire. And it wasn't necessarily something that was passed down hereditarily, it was usually something that was passed down uh, by election. The German princes would get together and say, hey, we like you, you're gonna be in charge now. Oftentimes it ended up being hereditary uh, or someone that they thought would last a while longer. Um, so they might pick a young person, or they might pick someone who's, you know, experienced enough, but looks like they've still got some time to be kicking. <laughs> oh my gosh, I got him! <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing in this game, and it's probably very obvious to some of you by my inability to pick up some weapons. Okay, so the next question I have is, uh, tell me about the letter that Caesar uh, received from Cato. So this is uh, this is backwards, actually. So Cato received a letter from Caesar, unless you're talking about something else that I'm not aware of. Um, basically, Cato and Caesar, and we're talking about Julius Caesar here, did not really like each other. And this is before the formation of the first triumvirate. Um, Caesar was, or Julius was not yet emperor. Uh, but, so he, he's been having all of these arguments with Cato, and basically they are amounting to who should be doing what, um, and who should be kind of in control. Obviously they each want to be, and so Cato is up giving this big impassioned speech about how bad Julius is, essentially. And while he's doing this, Julius, you know, either walks up to and hands him that way, or hands him by, oh, man. hands him just by like passing the note along, a love letter written from Tato's sister to Julius Caesar. Uh, they've been most likely uh, having an affair, although it's possible that it's just Julius Caesar trying to brag about Cato's sister's love for him. Um, but come on, I mean, let's, let's be honest, it's Julius Caesar, it's probably, probably wasn't a fair. Oh, how did I get him? I should not have had that. I don't know if people will just suck more than me or if I'm actually halfway decent. Anyway, um, so Cato, you know, gets this letter passed to him, basically proving that his sister is sleeping with his enemy, and oh my goodness, he had some kind of response that like was an attempt to make himself look good, but ended up just kind of falling flat and he was kind of awkward about the whole thing. Oh, so just imagine, right, if like during a political debate between like Trump and Hillary Clinton, right? Imagine if Trump basically passed Hillary Clinton a letter written by Chelsea. Oh, that ended up working. <laughs> oh my gosh, should not have. Um, and that, imagine so Trump passes a letter to Hillary from Chelsea Clinton, basically saying that Chelsea's in love with Donald Trump and she misses their nights together and all this stuff and Hillary just kind of reads it and tries making some smart remark about it but it it falls short that's that's essentially what happened
how did America get its accent? All the other British settlements sound British even today. I would, I would challenge that a little bit. I don't know that all of them sound British even today. Obviously, they might sound more British than we do, especially if you're comparing um, like Australian or New Zealand. Then I would say, yes, you're definitely right. They do sound more British. Hey. I'm going to pause on that question, and I'll uh, get into another game, and then I'll answer that in another game. Celtic Kraut. Okay. All right. Trek to God. All right. Party Animal. Oh, all right. If he doesn't win, if he doesn't carry us, then uh, I'm going to be pretty disappointed. We were talking about how America got its accent while everyone else sounds British. And I'm, like I said, I would challenge that. Um, I would make it kind of, um, I would, I would point out that, hey, oh jeez. I would point out that yes, some of them definitely do sound more British than others. But some of them also don't. I mean, Canada sounds a lot more like us. Um, nice. You know, Canada obviously sounds more like us, or I guess you could argue we sound more like Canada. Um, so, you know, there is there is that argument that not all of them sound uh, British, just some of them. That being said, there definitely is uh, some sort of connotate, or some sort of correlation between uh, companies or countries that sound more British and how recently they gained independence, whether de facto or de jure, uh, from the British. So obviously the Americas, we gained our independence uh, from the British first, earlier than most other countries did. We also have had way more influences than other, than other countries have. So for example, we in the United States have had influence between French, German, uh, Native American accents as they've learned English. Uh, we've had influence from Spanish, from Italian, from Irish. I mean, the United States is very much a nation of immigrants and built on immigration from day one. That's just how it is. And because of that, that means we have a lot more um, Uh, that means we have a lot more accent to change, right? So if you have these French speakers speaking English, you have these Irish speak Irish Americans speaking English, or these Irish immigrants, you know, speaking English. You've got Italians, Germans. Uh, everyone who's learning English is going to have an influence on the way the accent sounds long term. That's also going to impact things like um, the words we use and the actual vernacular and even the grammar to some extent. I mean, if you look at how people down in the South speak and you compare it to people even in New York City, it's it's a different, pardon me, it's a different accent, it's a different dialect. You could even, I think, easily make the case. I, I don't think someone from the swamps of the bayou in Louisiana would be able to talk to someone who lives uh, or grew up in the Irish highlands. I, I don't think that it would really work. Uh, that they really understand each other, and that's just because it's two different dialects of the same language. It's still English, but it's not the same kind of English. And, I mean, especially if you look at the South, it's very French-influenced, because that's who was originally colonizing it. Now, is that true for 100% of the time? Jeez. No, that's not true for 100% of things. Now, when you look at things like Australia, they gain their independence much later. They are much closer to that original accent. New Zealand, they gained their independence even later. Um, again, very similar to that accent. And you also have um, Aboriginal languages, um, which would have affected the accent that people have. Hey. As well as um, native New Zealand or Maori you know, speakers learning the accent from British. And I mean, we can even see that a little bit today. I mean, if you find someone who 
you know, like, is, say, German, but they learned English from a Brit, they'll have a different accent than someone who learned English oops, from an American. And they'll still have that mixture of a German accent and an American accent, um, or, I mean, sorry, German accent and that American or British accent. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting mix. I'm not a linguist, <laughs> so this just seems like I'm rambling on. I'm just gonna move on. All right, so here's my last question. Um, why do you feel history has become an undervalued subject in education? This is a great question, and there's no one answer to this, I don't think. So if you disagree with me, that is A-OK, -okay, and that is your prerogative. I would say history has become an undervalued uh, subject in American education because we focused a lot on STEM. And, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. If you want to prepare someone for... Ooh. Wow, okay. How did I... If you want to prepare someone for a real-world job, and you want to give them the best tools to earn money and achieve success, a STEM education is the one that does that. Uh, I mean, STEM STEM majors are the ones that provide a lot of value to um, the ones that provide a lot of value to a company. That's your computer programming, especially. What? Who killed me? Anyway. Um, your STEM, your STEM degrees, your STEM classes are going to be the ones that most adequately prepare people for the widest range of jobs. And so it makes sense that that is a focus um, because, I mean, how many computer programmers do we need and compare that to how many actors do we need? You know, we need a lot more computer programmers and car mechanics. We need a lot more engineers. Then we need writers. Then we need video editors. Then we need historians. One historian can write down tons of history, and if you don't believe me, just read Herodotus. A career outside of history can, I think, very adequately be prepared for by a number of different degrees, whereas a degree in history is really only going to prepare you for a few, um, a few different career paths. And while those career paths end up having a lot of jobs, right, you can go into politics, law, um, academia like there's a lot of different things you can do but your choices are genuinely a little bit more limited than someone who might have a degree in civil engineering and I understand that I totally get that and then also when you think about it how much value does writing down a corporation's history add to the corporation not nearly as much as someone who can write a program or create a new product that helps the company, um, you know, work better and get a lot more value in a faster amount of time and work more efficiently. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Now that being said, I don't think history should be as undervalued as it is. And we see that uh, just with the sheer amount of people who can't tell fact from opinion, who listen to what other people say and use that as the truth instead of uh, listening to what is being told, you know, figuring out what is fact and what is fiction and deciding for themselves. People today want to be told what is true instead of figuring it out for themselves. And that is a big issue. And history is something that really teaches logic, understanding, source evaluation, and critical and analytical thinking. So history should be taught and focused a lot more just so that people can like think more clearly and think better and more independently. Uh, at the same time, I also think history needs to be understood and known so that we can avoid the mistakes of the past. And, and this might sound a little controversial, but it seems really interesting to me that we spent so much time in the 1960s trying to desegregate and trying to get everybody to be treated equally and equitably in every aspect of life and yet now here we are trying to say that you know we need to be segregating people based on race just so that we can adequately understand each other and so that we can adequately learn better or talk about issues and i i don't think that's good i think that's just regression it's going back because people don't understand you know what life was like when it was segregated 
I think history is undervalued because history is power. And if history is undervalued and nobody knows what power is or what that power brings, the citizens are powerless and the government can do whatever they want. Governments can do whatever they want. And people are left not knowing what's going to come when really it's already happened before. I don't think history repeats itself. History rhymes. I think that's Mark Twain. And if we don't know where that rhyme is going to go, we're left out in the dust. This has been a really weird video because I'm stuttering a lot and I get that, but uh, thanks for watching. I think I'm going to minimally edit this. It's going to be a long video. We'll see how that goes with the algorithm. See ya.